Hi everyone and welcome to Terrington St. Clement Parish Church Online. I'm Mark, the Families and Youth Minister at the Church, and a big hello to our regular congregation members and a special welcome if you're visiting us on our YouTube channel. Well, today we're concluding our short summer series looking at the fifth section of the first few chapters of Paul's le first letter to the Corinthians. As we've done every week for the last four months, we've chosen some YouTube videos uh, of hymns and songs for us to go over to as the service goes along. The links for those were in the email that was sent around and they're also in the description box below. So let's begin our time by saying together some of Paul's words that he writes to the Christians in Philippi. So together, therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Now let's sing our first song, or quietly listen to it if you prefer. Ye servants of God, your master proclaim. As we move into a time of confession, let's reflect on the following words from Psalm 79. Let's say these words together. Help us, God, our Saviour, for the glory of your name, Deliver us and forgive us our sins for your name's sake. We'll have a moment of quiet before we say the confession together. So together, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought, word and deed. Through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault, we are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that has passed and grant that we serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. May the God of love bring us back to himself, forgive us our sins, and assure us of his eternal love. In Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, let's sing our second song before Hannah reads from God's word. So feel free to go over to our second song, All I Once Held Dear. Good morning. The reading today is from 1 Corinthians chapter 4. This then is how you ought to regard us, as servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the mysteries God has revealed. Now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. I care very little if I am judged by you or by any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. At the time, each will receive their praise from God. Now, brothers and sisters, I have applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, so that you may learn from us the meaning of the saying, do not go beyond what is written. Then you will not be puffed up in being a follower of one of us over against the other. For who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? Already you have all you want. Already you have become rich. You have begun to reign, and that without us. How I wish that you had really begun to reign, so that we might also reign with you. 
For it seems to me that God has put us apostles on display at the end of the procession, like those condemned to die in the arena. We have been made a spectacle to the whole universe, to angels as well as to human beings. We are fools for Christ, but you are so wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are honoured, we are dishonoured. To this very hour, we go hungry and thirsty. We are in rags, we are brutally treated, we are homeless. We work hard on our, with our own hands. We are cursed, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure it. When we are slandered, we answer kindly. We have become the scum of the earth, the garbage of the world, right up to this moment. I am writing this not to shame you, but to warn you as my dear children. Even if you had 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. Therefore, I urge you to imitate me. For this reason, I have sent you Timothy, my son, whom I love, who is faithful in the Lord. He will remind you of my way of life in Christ Jesus, which agrees with what I teach everywhere in every church. Some of you have become arrogant, as if I were not coming to you. But I will come to you very soon, if the Lord willing. And then I will find out not, o not only how these arrogant people are talking, but what power they have. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. What do you prefer? Shall I come to you with a rod of discipline, or shall I come in love and with a gentle spirit? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> Thanks, Anna, very much. Let's pray before we look at God's word. Father, we, we thank you that your word is a light to our path. Help us, we pray, by your spirit to hear your word and to walk in your ways. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I wonder, what do you look for in a Christian leader? Maybe you want someone trendy. Maybe you want someone organised. Maybe they need to be of a certain age. The list could be massive. Maybe you haven't ever thought about it. Well, today we're in our final passage of our 1 Corinthians mini-series, and we've come to the end of Paul's first section of his letter. He's been dealing with how the Corinthian Christians view Christian leadership. Remember that they have been picking their favourites based on worldly wisdom. Some like Paul, others like Apollos, some like another and so on. At Corinth, you were sure to go down well if you were an impressive speaker. The culture of the city was into new ideas and impressive philosophies and speech. And like many places then and today, the city and its culture were very much still in the church. Paul has been trying to fix their view on godly leaders in the church and the importance of preaching Christ crucified, which has the power to save. It's way more powerful than any clever oratory skills. And here in chapter four, we see Paul tying these strands together and driving the message home. It's not just a local issue Paul is dealing with. It's about how they view him and the other apostles as well. We don't know the details, but there's clearly been some talk of Paul's unimpressive manner. Let's pick out the main punch under these headings. Firstly, godly leaders are servants of Christ with a cross-shaped message. Have a look at verse 1. This then is how you ought to regard us, as servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the mysteries God has revealed. Paul's summary of this opening section starts here and he wants to be clear on how he and the other apostles and leaders in the church are to be regarded. Now, we can take the broad principles in this and apply them to Christian leaders in our context, whether vicars, chaplains, junior church leaders, Bible study group leaders, as Robert spoke about last time. And the first thing that Paul underlines is that they are servants of Christ and they are entrusted with the mysteries God has revealed. It's worth noting they are servants of Christ first. It doesn't say that they are servants of the church, though that is a major part of their role, of course. But they are serving Christ first. It's important that godly Christian leaders serve Christ first. 
They are doing what they are doing for him and his glory. They are doing it for Christ and not themselves. At least they ought to be. But the congregation members need to think about this too. Their leaders are doing what they are doing to honour Christ and not themselves. But some of the Corinthians had different thoughts on this, didn't they? They had their favourites and were causing divisions in the church. If everyone was thinking about serving Christ in the ways which God had gifted them, both leaders and members, then no such favouritism and divisions would exist, for all would be honouring Christ rather than man. The other major role is these servants of Christ bring a cross-shaped message. They don't bring their own message, they bring God's message. They're entrusted with God's truth and they need to preach Christ crucified, like Paul has talked about in earlier chapters. The message of the cross is the message by which people are saved, not by a man-made message, not by clever speech or human wisdom, not by a new idea or the latest fad, but by the message that Christ died to save people from their sins and to bring them back to God. Some of the Corinthians had a problem with this too, didn't they? They wanted impressive sounding speakers, so impressive that their high-flying friends at the golf club would pay attention. But no, the servants of Christ who bring the message are to be more concerned with faithful preaching of God's truth. They are, after all, truth transferers. It's a responsible role. And notice that they will be judged by God for their work. It's God who decides whether his servants who deliver his truth have done a good job. It's not the congregation's job to judge the success or the performance of the servant's work. Verses 2 to 5. Now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. I care very little if I am judged by you or by any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives, motives of the heart. At that time, each will receive their praise from God. Some of the Corinthians had the wrong view on how a Christian leader was judged to be successful. They thought they were on a performance review panel, and they were wrong. Paul is not being arrogant here when he says, I care very little if I am judged by you or any human court. Verse 3 he knows the one who he is serving, who will judge justly. God is the only one who can determine the faithfulness of his servants. Only he can do a performance review. Only God can see the seeds that have been planted or the amount of watering that they have done. He is the one who will decide how spiritually effective his servants of the word have been. So we need to stop comparing leaders, don't we? If if we're doing so. We need to avoid divisions in the church by avoiding having favourites. We need to remember that God alone will judge the performance of his servants. We, from our, our extremely limited, mortal, sinful point of view, cannot see the seeds. We cannot see the watering that God sees has been done and that he makes grow. If a Christian leader is bringing the message of Christ crucified, then it's a good indicator to the people of God that they are faithful servants of Christ. It's a good start, isn't it? It may indicate that they are trusting in God's power to save. If they are not preaching Christ crucified, then alarm bells should sound everyone. The second point to consider is godly leaders are fools for Christ with a cross-shaped lifestyle. Verses 6 to 13. In this section, Paul wanted the Corinthians to dump the world-pleasing attitude that they had. There's two main chunks to this. Firstly, in verses 6 to 8, he talk, talks of the importance of not going beyond what is written. Leaders in Christchurch 
need to stick with God's truth and not go beyond it. The Corinthians were relying on human wisdom and, and impressive speech. Some were making out that gifts that they had been given by God were their own, verse 7. They were boasting, they were trying to be more impressive than others. They were drawing unhelpful comparisons. They perhaps felt the need to impress, to fit in with the surrounding culture. That's the first part, highlighting the Corinthians' worldly behaviour. And this could have been among their leadership. Then there's the second part, verses 8 to 13, where Paul rebukes their error with harsh irony. Verse 8. Already you have all you want. Already you have become rich. You have begun to reign, and that without us. How I wish that you really had begun to reign so that we also might reign with you. Already they have become rich. Already they have become begun to reign. They are the bee's knees, so impressive with all their gifts. Notice how Paul describes himself and the other apostles, verse 9. For it seems to me that God has put us apostles on display at the end of the procession, like those condemned to die in the arena. We have been made a spectacle to the whole universe, to angels as well as to human beings. They are the opposite, aren't they? They are despised by the world. They are like those prisoners of war brought back after a battle and are at the end of the victory procession, thrown in to fight gladiators or be torn apart by animals for the amusement of the people. They are the scum of the earth, he describes. These are strong words from Paul, aren't they? But an important point is, that Christian leaders are not to be in with the world. They preach Christ crucified and are unimpressive by worldly standards. Paul mentions that they work with their hands, verse 12, and that's something that the Corinthian elite would have looked down on. The apostles are fools in the world's eyes, fools for Christ. Paul saw himself as scum. The Corinthians saw themselves as great. The Christian life ought to look very different to the way of the world. Are Christian leaders popular with the world today? Most of them aren't, I suspect. If they are, then maybe that should set off an alarm bell. If they are boastful about their gifts, if they don't acknowledge that what they have is from God, then perhaps alarm bells ought to go off for those things too. It's very easy to be fools for the world instead of fools for Christ, being concerned with the here and now. It's easy to get into comparing ourselves with others, like somewhere in the church at Corinth. We've all been guilty in some way, haven't we? The thought that says, well, I'm better than them because I can do X, Y or Z, or I'm not as bad as them because I haven't done A, B or C. Our hearts jump on these things if we let them. It's our sinful pride talking, wanting to massage, massage our own egos or position, and it can happen in all sorts of ways. It's easy to be concerned with the lifestyle of this age. We see what others have around us and what they do with their spare time, the places they go. It's easy to get into worrying about that stuff or making it a priority. If we've been following the first few chapters of the Corinthians these last few weeks and we've thought well at least we're not like them. Be careful. The Corinthians were Christians with hearts just like our own. Sinful hearts. We are no better. In Christ we're all on a level playing field. All the gifts we've been given are exactly that. Given by God. We've got nothing to boast about. About ourselves. And no worldly comparisons are needed. Godly leaders and godly Christians are fools for Christ with a cross-shaped lifestyle. Lastly, we consider godly leaders are fathers in Christ with a cross-shaped love, verses 14 to 21. 
Of course, we can have godly mothers in Christ too, but as Paul addresses himself as father to the Corinthians, I've put that in the title. Here at the end of the opening section of the letter, Paul wants them to recall their relationship with him. Paul rebukes them not to shame them, but to warn them. He loves them. Despite all their problems they are causing, he regards them as his children in Christ. He loves them as a father would. Verse 14. I am writing this not to shame you, but to warn you as my dear children. Even if you had 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. There was a big danger of them viewing Paul and the other apostles as a threat because they were puffed up, weren't they? They were comparing them to others applying worldly performance standards. They had forgotten to focus on the special relationship that they had with Paul. When we forget about the relationship that we have with people and focus on comparing them, X is better than Y because of P, Q and R, then we're acting in a very unloving way towards our brothers and sisters in Christ. Whenever we're tempted to do the whole favourite competition thing, resist and think about how to grow the relationship with that person instead. How to love. And if that doesn't stop us, then think about what God has done for you in Christ. For you to be in a relationship with him, what has he done? Our God is the greatest relationship mender, isn't he? Loving us so much that he sent his son to die so that we might know him. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you for all the leaders, all of the Christians in our lives who have explained your truth to us. Thank you for their faithfulness. We're sorry, Father, when we get sucked into the world, when we start to compare, when we cause divisions, when we don't follow the way of the cross. Thank you, Father, that you love us as dear children. Thank you that we're safe in the Lord Jesus by what he has done for us in his life, death and resurrection. Help us to love you and help us to love one another, united as your church for your glory and in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in our third song, we sing the words, Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my God. So feel free to go over to When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. And now Lucy is going to lead us in prayer. Hello, let us pray. Our Father, you know our hearts and our minds and no secrets are hidden from you. And so we humbly come before you to present our requests, knowing that you are a good God who loves to hear our prayers and answers in ways that are beyond our understanding with generosity and with great love. We lift up the things that are happening in our church family this week. We pray for the garden picnic together and the switch social this afternoon. We pray for the rock cafe online. We pray that each of these activities would be um, times of fun and encouragement, that where people can meet together, the fellowship um, is really encouraging we ask that you would keep us connected as a church family, helping to look out for one another and to care for one another. In your mercy, hear our prayer. We also pray for our services on Sundays as we move forwards, 
We pray that as many of us long to get back to our normal Sunday services as soon as possible, that you would help us um, as a church family and especially for the leadership to find ways that make it safe and practical to do so. We pray that the questionnaire prepared would provide useful information. And we pray that as um, Robert and Mark and others prepare for, for further um, ways to help us to meet face to face, that you would give them wisdom and insight on how to implement that. And that each one of us would bear with one another out of love for you as we seek to do what is best in the best interests um, for us as a church family, recognising that every um, solution won't be perfect but that your love is perfect for us and we should love one another. We pray for um, people that we know, both within the church family and those that we know in our community and in our families. We pray especially for those who are known to us who are lonely, who are ill, who have been bereaved recently, those who are exhausted or bored, those who are in need, and those facing hardship. We pray that you would send your spirit into their lives, giving them hope, faith and love. We pray that as a church family, we would be the hands, mouth and feet of Jesus as we demonstrate um, your love, as we care for one another. We pray for the words of Jesus to be close to those who know you when he says, come to me all who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. We pray for those of us um, who are anxious ourselves and we pray that you would remind us that you tell us to cast our anxieties on you because you care for us. In your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray more widely for our country's leaders and for the leaders around the world. We pray that you would be appointing leaders into position who um, uphold godly principles. We pray that they would love and not hate. We pray that they would promote justice tempered with mercy and that they would always seek to protect the vulnerable and the poor. We pray for people in leadership to serve those who they represent and not to seek power for themselves. We pray especially for our own country that you would uphold your ways and that you would prevail over the decisions being made so that your word may be preached freely and easily in this country. In your mercy, hear our prayer. We can now join together in the words of the Lord's Prayer by saying it together. And so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Thanks very much, Lucy. Well, we're back in the sunny room here. Well, in our final song, we sing the words, My heart is filled with thankfulness to him who reigns above, whose wisdom is my perfect peace, whose every thought is love. Let's keep holding on to him who reigns above. So feel free to go over to the song video for My Heart is Filled with with thankfulness. Well, let's close our time together by saying the words of the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Well, big thanks to Christine, as ever, for the music choices and uh, to Lucy for the prayers and to Hannah for the reading. And thank you for joining us today. 
Next week, we'll be joining one of our partner churches, St Andrew the Great in Cambridge. Uh, details of how to access that service will be sent out um, this coming week. And there will also be a notice here on the YouTube channel. So our next service here on the Terrington channel will be our All Age service on the 6th of September. So hopefully you can join us for that. Also, be sure to check out the latest episode of Rock Cafe online here on the channel. And one final thing to mention is that there's no Zoom chat this morning as many of the church family are getting ready for our socially distanced lunch together. It's this afternoon and we're going to be outside in various locations with picnics. So hope you have a good couple of weeks everyone and love to all.